Welcome to the Author to Authority podcast. I'm Kim Thompson Pinder, and this is my wonderful co host, Juanita Wooden Radko. And today we're going to be talking about finding your voice in the Big Bang Theory. And uh, you know what? You guys are going to really enjoy this. But just before we get started, you know, Juanita and I had a really great conversation on the last podcast. And we finished our series on the five roadblocks to writing a book. So if, if you missed that episode, first of all, I recommend you subscribe on your favorite podcast app or YouTube. But if you missed that episode, make sure you go back and you listen to it because we covered things like self-confidence, who to write to, what to write about. So we covered the last three and it was a really good episode. And if you're considering writing a book, we, I highly recommend go back, listen to those two episodes so you know what you're facing before you even get started. So I want to welcome my co-host Juanita. She is going to be leading the charge today as we talk about finding your voice in the Big Bang Theory. Hi, Kim. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> well, I was thinking about the Big Bang Theory and how it related to writing, which is kind of a cuckoo idea I suppose but I bear with me <laughs> my thought was about how the different guys I'm just going to focus on four guys this time Leonard Sheldon Raj and Howard okay. the four main characters and how they can relate to your writing voice now everyone has a unique style or voice when they write and Sometimes their writing voice doesn't necessarily translate the same as their speaking voice. And sometimes the message that people want to give gets overshadowed by their writing voice. Hmm. So I wanted to explore what I meant by that by using some of the characters from Big Bang Theory to illustrate examples and talk with you about ways that we can fix some of those mistakes and avoid miscommunication. Yeah, and I think that's really important, especially when you're an entrepreneur, when you're a professional, you know, when you're trying to get yourself out there, position yourself as that go-to person. Um, you know, how you speak is very important, but your writing has to match your speaking to give that congruent mm -hmm. picture. Because if you speak well and you write horribly, it's going to actually reflect on how people uh, see you and whether they choose to work with you or not. Yes, and it, it can be very jarring. Like, it, it raises a question in the reader's mind, well, which one is the real you? Which one is the authentic mm. voice? And that's yes. very important to consider. You don't want your clients, your readers thinking, oh, He's a phony. She's, she's not really being honest with me. Mm -hmm. So it's important to have that uh, mirroring in both, uh, both your speaking and your writing. Awesome. So the first voice that I'm going to use in as example is based around Leonard. Mm -hmm. Leonard, like all the guys in this show, uh, is very smart. And he can be funny, a little sarcastic. And he's the portrayed as the typical nice guy, but he's often afraid and insecure in how he expresses himself. It takes him, oh, so many months, so many episodes to express his affection to Penny, the next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. He lacks confidence. If you're writing with an insecure voice like Leonard, your writing examples tend to have things like, I have often noticed that it seems this way. People don't realize that these many things can happen. They pad their, uh, whatever they're going to say, with an explanation. Mm. And one of the things that I find is very helpful is to remove qualifiers. When you say, I think that... Yes. People should take out their recycling. Just write, 
People should take out the recycling. You, you think it, then write it like a command rather than a, a politely re worded request. That's one thing that helps. And do you think that people do that because they are insecure? So they're, they're trying to soften it so maybe people won't be offended by it? That can be part of it. I know that this is something that women sometimes do when writing emails to work colleagues, for example, they tend to couch things in, would you please do this? Could you? So you're softening it as a re to a request rather than a, you need to do this, rather than a direct instruction because you don't want to be perceived as... Um, Aggressive? Oh, yes. And when really you just want to be assertive and clear in your communication. Mm -hmm. You know, email writing is another animal altogether. And if you want to be perceived as an authority, you need to write assertively and without the qualifiers. And you can support your ideas with facts from external, for, pardon me, external sources, not forces. You really <laughs> think about being aggressive and powerful. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I think too, like one of the things that we talk a lot about with our clients is when you use phrases like that, they're not grammatically wrong, but it's considered weak writing. Yes. Awesome. Sheldon. So, oh, did you want to? <laughs> I was going to say, who's next on our list? <laughs> <laughs> Sheldon. He's the, uh, really, I kind of feel like Although Leonard is the lead man and ostensibly the, the one the show's uh, focused on, Sheldon stands out because in a show full of highly educated people, he's that much further along. He's probably genius. He's uh, often very socially unaware and obtuse. And he's possibly neuroatypical. They never really get into that, but socializing is very difficult so where his where sheldon falls down is not in his ability to express his ideas clearly and assertively but rather he's confident to the point of arrogance mm -hmm. he often comes across that he thinks everybody else is dumb because on one level yeah compared to him they they are a little bit they're just so not it's condescending <laughs> absolutely and it's almost like all their brain power goes into being academic, that they have no brain power left for anything else. It's a, yeah, it's missing, he's missing emotional, the EQ, the emotional quotient, yes. rather than the intelligence quotient. Um, the, uh, I feel like there's, there's two halves to this. There's overly specialized, Mm -hmm. which can happen. I know when I'm excited about a topic where I've done a lot of study in myself, I can fall into the trap of using so much jargon mm -hmm. and expecting yes. people to know what I'm talking about when they, I'm already on chapter seven when they haven't, they don't even know what textbook I'm referring to. I've gone <laughs> that deep into the, <laughs> into the topic because, oh, this seems interesting. It's uh, not that they wouldn't understand, but that I'm, I'm in a different place. So I often find that uh, that's one thing is to make sure that my audience is uh, on the same page as me in both a metaphorical and literal sense. And the other thing I like to make sure is that I'm talking to my audience like they are a, a companion, a friend. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking down to a child who is particularly dull. Mm -hmm. um, I feel I that one thing that helps is using jargon. If you're going to use specialized words, uh, then you need to explain 
the terms clearly in a few sentences so that your audience can go, okay, yeah, I know that, you know, backstitch is, means something different when you're hand sewing compared to machine sewing. Mm -hmm. So they have the context and then you can explain why you would wish to do one thing differently in one situation than in the other. I always think when we talk about things like this of Anna Green Gables, where Gilbert says to Anne after reading her book that it was highfalutin mumbo jumbo. <laughs> and she was furious. <laughs> yeah. In the movie, she, she decked him with the... <laughs> and I get the feeling, I, I sympathize with Anne that, you know, why do I have to come, like, bring my ideas down when, you know, they're, they look so beautiful. You tend to fall in love with your own ideas, which is another danger. <laughs> but, but sometimes uh, I feel the best way to describe it would be what Einstein said. Simplify as much as is necessary, but no further. Yes. You know, you don't need to make everything into pablum. Yes. All right. So who's next on our list here? <laughs> Howard Wallowitz. <laughs> oh, if, oh my goodness. He's the guy who's like, was your mother a thief? <laughs> was your father a thief? Well, then who stole the stars from the sky and put them in your eyes? He <laughs> had more sleazy innuendos than I have ever heard. Oh, it's, that is how he starts off as in the early seasons. He eventually grows into a better character. He's not completely reformed, but he improves. <laughs> and where the crass voice comes in, is when people write they want to seem hip and relatable and so they will use swearing sexual innuendo um rude and crude yeah just being crude and you know toilet humor and it's like while at times the there's a place for that sure it's you know it's not live at the apollo your book is representing you. And in that instance, I feel like it's really important that you put on a professional persona mm -hmm. and leave your weekend self for the weekends and not in the pages of your book. Because you don't know who in your audience you're going to alienate. Mm -hmm. And you risk losing connection on something that's really very easy to control. And I think that includes all of your content, especially your social media. People don't yes. realize that, you know, you can't be one person one way and then another person on social media because people check you out. You know, they check out your website, they check you out on social media, they see what you're doing. And, you know, if you come across you know, as this very professional person, and then they come across you on Facebook, and you've got all this rude, crude stuff on there, you know, and pictures of you partying on, dude, you know, um, you know, they're not necessarily going to want to work with you. Yes, because you're, ref you're judged by the company you keep. Mm -hmm. And social media really magnifies that. Finally, I'm going to talk about Raj, and I call him the lost voice, mm. because for in the early seasons, if there was a female character in the room, he could not speak. He would <laughs> whisper to Howard, and Howard would act as his translator, and then once the female character exited, exited the scene, then he'd be like, oh, and he had plenty to say. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel that's like, this is going to sound like I'm contradicting myself with uh, what I may have said earlier, that you need to write 
you can write to too small an audience. Mm. If you're, when you're talking about using your jargon, if you're, if you're not inclusive of the people that you're aiming your book towards, you're going to lose them. If you're too vague about your ideas and too general, both cases, you're missing your intended audience. Mm. So it really is important to understand who you're writing your book to yeah. and to speak with them in a way that connects you both. And this is the point, Kim, where I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about how the RTI uh, publishing questionnaire, client questionnaire, really helps people uh, find who their ideal reader is. Yeah, so when we bring a client into RTI Publishing, the first thing we have them do is fill out this questionnaire. And the point of the questionnaire is to help them determine uh, the two big questions that we actually discussed in the, the last podcast uh, together, which is, you know, who are you writing this book to? And, you know, what are you writing this book about? Um, I always teach that you know, if you write to everybody, your book will be ineffectual and wishy-washy. So, you know, our first, when we first bring on a client, you know, those first couple of sessions are a lot about, you know, who you're writing to, you know, what are their wants, needs, problems, desires. Like we take a really in-depth look at that person before we even start the book writing process, because it's important to know who we're writing this book to. So when you are writing a book, creating content, you know, sending out e mass emails, you know, all of those kinds of things, you want to make sure that you are writing to the right person and that you're not trying to write to everybody about everything. Um, you know, you want your communication to be clear and you're okay with the fact that it's not for everybody. You're not trying to reach everybody. You're trying to reach a group of specific people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when we were in school and you had a writing assignment, your teacher would give you an idea of, I wanted to cover these certain points. And if you didn't cover those points, then you weren't going to get as high a mark. It's kind of the same idea is that you're wanting to check off that list. Mm -hmm. So in contrast to the characters in the Big Bang Theory, when you're working on your own writing voice, you want to aim for writing that sounds confident, yes, professional, informed, and natural. Yes. When you keep these points in mind, you can be confident that your audience is understanding you and your message. Now, I just want to go back for a second because you do want it to sound natural, but it still has to be readable. So there, there's a balance between the two because sometimes yeah. your natural voice does not translate well into writing. So you do want it to be natural, but you still have to, I, I think one other point that we'd have to add is, you know, check your grammar, check your spelling, you know, have... If it's something really important, have somebody else read it first so that they can give you feedback. Are they understanding what you're trying to say? Are they clear, you know, in what you're trying to say? Do, you, do, they, feel, do they feel like you did it in a, a concise, confident manner, right? So that's always, a, you know, a very important thing. So, you know, I've written personally over 100 books and have worked on more than that. And when I write my own books, and I am in the process of writing Author to Authority, it will be out in 2020. In fact, I'm hoping to release three books in the Author to Authority series in 2020. Um, but you need to understand that when I write, it goes to my team. You know, Juanita's the head of my team, goes to her first, mm -hmm. and then it goes to the other team members. And they scrutinize that thing with a fine-tooth comb. And so it doesn't matter how long you've been writing for. Like I said, I've written over a hundred books. Each book has been a hundred to 200 pages. You know, there's 300 to 500 words per page. I can tell you, I have written a lot of words and that's not bragging. It's just the truth of the matter. But even at this point, I still 
anything important that I need to send out, even including sometimes emails, goes to Juanita first and I get her feedback. So, you know, and she always gives me such lovely feedback. It's like, Kim, I really don't think that's going to work. Let's try it this way. <laughs> <laughs> Kim, your tone is not confident. Kim, you're being a little rude. So... <laughs> Yes, sometimes we step on the other side of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you want to improve your writing and your writing voice, one of the main ways that, that you can do that is through feedback. And that's an, a very important aspect of learning how to write. One of the things that I've done for several of my clients is it, while we were writing their book, they were writing blog posts. And so for some of them, um, they would send me their blog posts and I do quick feedback on it, you know, little rewrites and quick feedback to help them improve their writing styles so that it's um, matching the book. So when the book Very comes important. out, their writing style has uh, improved to that point so that there's consistency um, throughout. So uh, I'm going to let you have some closing thoughts there and then I... I have a closing thought to share as well. Okay, great. Well, I just wanted to say that this is not something that you can flip a switch overnight. Mm, yes. It's something that you work on. And as Kim said, getting feedback from someone else is important. Reading what you've written out loud can often help and help you massage to your words even more to discover whether or not it sounds natural actually coming out of your mouth. Mm, yes. And if it sounds maybe a little too close to what's coming out of your mouth, <laughs> maybe you might need to raise the bar just a little bit. One of the big tools that I love, I use it all the time in office, is uh, using the synonyms or going to dictionary.com, thesaurus.com. My two best friends. Beside you. Changing the, uh, <laughs> and changing the word. Mm -hmm. When I first uh, wrote out my notes for the podcast, I was talking about how the, your message can be obscured. And then I was like, that isn't quite what I wanted to say. I'm close. But, and another suggestion was eclipsed. And I thought, Yes, but we're not quite there. And then I found overshadowed, mm. which gives you the idea that while you can still see what the message is, it's like there's a, a little dark covering. You're being shaded by uh, other parts of your message. So that was a, a valuable thing. And that was something simple. If you tend to repeat the same words, like, yes. I know we talked about this, like interesting, important, incredible. Those are three words that people tend to use often, often. And you have so many options out there. And my pet peeve would be things. If you can find another word instead of things, you will be a better writer. <laughs> If you can, when you're talking about it, if you need to drill down and specifically say, when I'm talking about things, what I actually mean is apples or fruit, that will be beneficial and clearer for your readers. You have many great books inside of you, friends, and this is where you start getting them out. So let's start working on your voice together. <laughs> Thanks, Juanita. And I remember one time you gave me the hint that if you have to reread something um, you, that you've done in like Word or something like that, change the font or change the size when you're reading it because then it makes it seem like it's brand new so you catch things. So, well, good stuff, Juanita. I am happy that we got to do this episode. And I just want to remind readers that we have a really great resource for you. It's a little book called Power Words, Attract High Paying Clients and Customers. And there's, so there's two sections to the book. The first section we talk about, or I write, I wrote about 
your speaking voice and your writing voice. And I give you lots of hints and tips on how to improve both of those voices. And then the last half of the book is a bunch of commonly used words and 10 alternatives for each one. So it is a great resource to help you increase your vocabulary, make your writing and your speaking voice, as Juanita would call it, delicious. <laughs> and, uh, you know, make it so that people want to hear you and people want to keep reading what you write. So it's a free book. You can get it at www.powerwords.pro. Uh, forward slash free book. So this has been the Author to Authority podcast. I'm Kim Thompson Pinder. I've been with Juanita Wood and Radko, and we will see you on the very next episode. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>